This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Week 7 is looking like a pretty fun one across the NFL. If Thursday night is any indication, that was a mess, but also a fun mess. And a fun mess is still fun. We're going to break down Week 7 from a prop betting perspective with J.J. Zacharyson and get his read on his favorite prop props to bet this week at FanDuel Sportsbook. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here once again by J.J. Zacharyson. Check him out at Late Round dot com and a late round fantasy football podcast jj happy friday to you how are you doing today i'm good had a lot of Jawan johnson and Eno benjamin going last night so i am uh i'm feeling good heading into week seven so with the amazon games the plus that you can watch like the replay and i went to bed before the end of the game so i got to watch the replay this morning i tried to avoid like spoilers and stuff and i like went to bed and my like single game lineups were like super super dusty missed uh, the benjamin touchdown got to see juan's two touchdowns that was fun missed the christian mccaffrey news i uh, didn't see that till this yeah, morning as well so it's been a a wild morning for me and just a, a wild game overall despite yeah. not having the the Arizona defense and special teams in my like main lineup wound up uh, being okay so it was a, yeah. a fun morning to wake up to for sure yeah no doubt any uh, hot takes you want to fire off about the McCaffrey trade or uh can we leave those for Twitter <laughs> no I mean I, I I think it what my my initial reaction obviously this is me just kind of uh off the dome here my my yeah. initial reaction was just it seems kind of redundant like mm-hmm. like with Debo and you know I, I I'm sure that Kyle Shanahan who is a, a, an offensive genius I mean he knows yeah. what he's doing I'm sure he's gonna properly use CMC yeah. um but it's just it's just one of those moves where I mean they're loaded from a talent perspective for sure um but it's a it's a scheme that we've historically talked about any running back can perform in and now right. they have arguably the best running back in football so either he goes nuclear or we're going to actually see, oh, you could actually just put a sixth round Elijah Mitchell in there, whoever, uh, and, and they will produce as well. I, I'm just curious to see sort of I think Debo is the, the big X factor for me in terms yeah. of usage and how they actually deploy him, because obviously he's been all over the field and they have a lot of those pieces now. Right. Like they have like CMC can play the slot. Uh, um, they, they have these guys and even use check is, is pretty yeah. versatile. Um, and so, you know, they have those pieces, which is why they, you know, Kyle Shanahan loves this kind of stuff. Like this is yeah. exactly what he does. Um, but it's just going to be interesting to see how it all plays out, you know, from a trend standpoint and what's most consistent and where these guys line line up most. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm pretty I, I wish that Trey Lance were healthy because this would be fun mm-hmm. to watch him in that offense. But I think that it's also the fact that they made this trade and unloaded that much draft capital probably makes it more likely that Lance is their starter next year. Yeah. Cause they have no capital to trade for a quarterback now. Yeah. So like as someone with Trey Lance dynasty, I was actually kind of like excited from that perspective. I don't know if that's like the selfish side of me. Like, Oh, maybe plus, I get plus you get CMC again now, year. right? Like yeah. plus, plus, plus he has Christian McCaffrey back there. So, I mean, I thought it was pretty fun. So I'll take it from that perspective. Uh, it was clearly impactful for prop betting, but um, as I just, Think about my Trey Lance dynasty teams. We'll, we'll talk about props for week seven here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Our week seven full betting preview is up and our college football week eight preview posted as well up on the uh, co- Covering the Spread podcast feed and on the FanDuel YouTube page as well. NBA season also underway. Now's the perfect time to download FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook, because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in free bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. You can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. Plus, with live betting, you'll get updated odds on games that have already started. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use, so download FanDuel today and get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Make every moment more this season with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and in select states. First online real money wager only. Refund issued is non-withdrawable free bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Arizona, call 100 next step or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. 
in Indiana, 1-800-9 with it. In Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. In Wyoming, 1-800-522-4700 or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's dig into some props here for week number seven and start things off by talking about things from a holistic perspective because scoring has been down this year. Offense in general is down, and obviously that has a big impact on touchdown props, but also impacts the yardage props, which we talk a lot about here. So what changes are you making in your process to account for this general downtick in offense? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that it's important to, to, you know, remember and, and when you're looking at whether it's some sort of projection system or model, what have you, a lot of them start at the team level first. Um, and a lot of them are, are taking trends from what's happening throughout this season already. You know, it's not a big sample by any means. It's six weeks, but it's still a sample and we're still seeing, you know, this going on, uh, you know, this season. So, you know, and then not only that, like my model, for instance, or my projections, I should say, uh, they use game lines as a baseline to start mm-hmm. things off. And so if that's pulling from a book uh, and books are recognizing this, then my projections are also going to recognize this to some degree as well. I think what really is important with this, uh, with this this uh, you know poor offensive play to start the year, um, it, you know, we, we can talk all day about why it's happening, but I think what's more important is that you know a lot of people are simply browsing player props whenever they're they're making bets. Um, and, and a lot of times when you do that psychologically, you could just see these lines appear to be way too low. Right. Um, and so you could just be looking and saying, oh, this, you know, Saquon Barkley can go over that easily or whatever, right. um, without realizing that, no, this is actually the norm. You know, this is, this is what we're expecting, um, you know, from these offenses right now. So I think it's more so that I think it's more so a change in your mentality. If you are being a, somewhat more subjective about your approach to these props, which is totally fine. That's the way that 99% of people are, are operating with, with these, with these player props. Um, But it's just important to not, you know, always just take these overs because there's a reason the lines are, are where they are. Well, I think it's also interesting that you said you take the, the betting markets into account because essentially then you're letting people who have a lot of money on the line dictate where you go, which sounds like a pretty efficient use of your time and trying to problem solve for something like this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my, my projections from a team level standpoint, you know, I, that's where I, I kick things off and start things. Um, it's pulling from that because obviously yeah. if there's movement or what, what have you, it's, it's a very easy and quick way to get uh, some sort of team total uh, from a projection standpoint where you don't have to do like right. crazy, crazy work in order to get to that point. So um, yeah, you know, if, if that's accounting for it, if that's accounting for these scoring changes, then it all falls into place that way, which is, you know, no different than what we've talked about in the off season with the way that I approach my season long projections where I'm looking at a team level first. And if there's an injury in the preseason to a quarterback or something like that, that impacts the team level projections. And then that has this domino effect on the rest of these positions that I'm projecting. So uh, it, it all starts there. And if that shifts and that changes, then it changes everything else. Yeah, work smarter, not harder. I think that's a key thing you're doing uh, with that. Okay, other key thing for week seven is that we got some key players potentially coming off injury. Jonathan Taylor should be good to go. DeAndre Swift sounds like he'll be good to go as well. Not definitive there, but I wanted to get your overall process and handling players coming off of injury. Obviously, a lot of factors will influence it, but what's your general outlook and how you handle things and trying to, to project how guys will be used in their first game back? I think overall, we're probably, as humans playing this game and and watching this game, we're probably way too optimistic about guys coming off injury, first off. Um, You know, I I think books generally recognize that to some degree. But, uh, you know, I I do think that it's definitely a case-by-case situation where there are some injuries uh, like hamstrings or knees, certain knee injuries, what have you, where they might play. They might seem like that they're healthy, but they're not totally, totally healthy yet. Whereas, like something like a ribs injury is a little bit different where they can just like put some, you know, even like Taysom Hill has been playing with a, with a ribs injury yeah. and they've been putting that, they talked about it last night, uh, you know, on that telecast where they were saying how, uh, you know, he's putting that like numbing stuff uh, on his ribs to help him out. And clearly he's been fine. Um, you know, so I, I also think that you have to be humble with the way that you approach this stuff and you have to be self-aware that you're not a doctor. Um, and so go seek out some help from other doctors that are out there that study this stuff and that, look into these things and can say, Hey, here's a study showing that, 
uh, you know, players coming off of a high ankle sprain, which is a really, really rough injury to come off of. Uh, they generally perform at 70%. This is just an arbitrary number, but they generally perform at 70% of their typical production. Um, so things like that can really help as well. I do think it's just more of a case by case. And then the other thing too, is watch practice reports. Like look at, yeah. look at how these guys are practicing and how they're trending. You know, if a guy doesn't practice all week and then he gets a limited practice in on Friday, well, that tells you that he's likely not fully healed and he's not feeling that great. Whereas if it's a player who started getting full practices in on Wednesday, uh, then you can feel a lot more optimistic about that player doing well in that week's game. So I think it's a case by case thing, but there are little things that you can do from a process standpoint to help increase your, your projection and in your accuracy with your projection. Yeah. The practicing is what I love the most personally, like Gabe Davis week before that 98 yard touchdown practice in full on Wednesday after being dealing with an ankle injury, seemed like he was healthier there. T Higgins this week, last week, didn't practice Wednesday at all right. this week, limited Wednesday, full practice Friday. To me, that says he's been playing through an injury, but he's getting healthier. And I think that that to me is, is a good signal to, dictate how to, to decide these things for sure now one situation we've had a, a good uh good amount of success with so far this year is you outlining situations you're targeting whether it be because of shifts you've seen whatever it may be which situations are you looking at for week seven to try to attack in the prop market yeah i mean i think we got to start with the broncos backfield um uh, because it's it's oh insane uh so Latavius Murray saw a lot of their ground game work, as we know, this past week. I think he had like 80% of the team's running back rushes or something like that. Um, but he only played six more snaps than Mike Boone. He he, he wasn't on the field uh, that much. It was just that when he was on the field, he was seeing a lot of work on the ground, which is great, of course. But that's also something, you know, we're looking at snaps, too, because that's a little bit more sustainable um, when, when we're looking at sustainability of these players' production. But then Nathaniel Hackett comes out and he says, hey, I talked to Melvin Gordon. Uh, who was frustrated after that game last week, and he's going to start now. Um, but then on top of that, they're facing the Jets, and the Jets have been an above-average team against running backs this year in terms of success rate, in terms of, I mean, fantasy points, what have you. I mean, they've been an above-average opponent. Um, I just think that it's a mess, uh, and I think that you could probably lean unders if you see a line that uh, you know is, is somewhat attractive. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this Broncos backfield situation is just not very easy to dissect, but it's definitely something to at least keep an eye on. Uh, this week. And I, I am more pessimistic than optimistic about it. Uh, another one is actually in that exact same game, the Jets pass catchers, because yeah. we have Elijah Moore, uh, who is very, uh, he, who's tilting his, his role right now. He's not very happy, which it's kind of understandable. I mean, he's a, he's a very, very good wide receiver with, with Elijah Moore and dynasty. I, I, I relate. Yeah. I yeah. It. So, you know, he's, he's a very, very good wide receiver. Um, you know, he's playing a role where last week we saw Corey Davis, uh, end up playing by far the most snaps in that Jets offense at wide receiver, which we hadn't seen all year. Uh, if anything, you know, Elijah Moore had consistently been the top wide receiver in snaps played. And then Garrett Wilson was starting to overcome Corey Davis a little bit. And then all of a sudden it was Corey Davis. That was the guy uh, for the Jets. So, you know, there's been a lot of volatility there, uh, but now Elijah Moore is upset and there's rumors that he might not even go this weekend against Denver, that the, the Jets will just bench him because he requested mm -hmm. this trade and they're frustrated, all that kind of stuff. The thing is, if that happens, you might see the lines for Davis or Garrett Wilson go up. But I hate this matchup. Like, I, the matchup is horrible. I mean, the, the Broncos have been good against wide receivers. They're good against a slot, too. Um, you know, I do think that they would probably end up throwing Braxton Berrios out there a lot to end up playing that role a little bit. So I, I, I just think the matchup is really bad. So if you see uh, some sort of response in the market with these wide receivers, I do think that I would attack the under still. Um, just because it's just a, a really rough situation in general from a matchup standpoint. And the Jets are playing good on defense. They're, they're, they, they have a very, very run-heavy script over, over, since Zach Wilson has been quarterback. It's not just Zach Wilson. It's game script that's, that's yeah. occurring, that's forcing that. But, I mean, this game, if, if Russell Wilson doesn't play, we have no idea at the point of this recording. But, like, even if he does play, he's not 100%. And it's not like the Broncos' offense has been that great. So the Jets could easily keep that game competitive and not have a very pass-heavy script. So... I'm just I'm just not very bullish on the Jets passing attack, which I don't think is is that much of a hot take. Right. Uh, and then the last one to monitor is this Ramondre Stevenson in, in the uh, New England backfield. Uh, Damian Harris, you know, speaking of watching practice yeah. reports, Damian Harris has been practicing. Uh, you know, the, the initial report was that he could be out a lot longer than what he's been out, but he's practicing and we have to recognize that Ramondre Stevenson over the last two weeks has played 90 percent and 85 percent of New England snaps. Uh, that's actually the two highest snap shares that New England running backs have seen since Deion Lewis in 2015. So wow. they're finally using this dude as a, as a true bell cow. But 
Damian Harris coming back definitely, definitely hurts that. When Ramondre Stevenson uh, was playing with Damian Harris after that Ty Montgomery injury in week one, he was seeing a snap share in that like 60% range. That's significantly lower than 90, 90%, 85%. Um, you know, maybe we see a 70% snap share from Ramondre Stevenson this week just because Damian Harris is coming off that injury. But I do think that we have to lower expectations for Ramondre and just make sure that the market is also uh, setting those expectations. Yeah, going back to the Jets too, like it's not just the script. They've also been effective running the football, which means mm-hmm. they don't have to throw that much. Mm-hmm. And you can run a bit on Denver, uh, like you'd prefer to run against them and throw against them at this point. So I think all those things do lend themselves towards being skeptical of the Jets, even if there's no Elijah Moore on Sunday. Okay, let's dig into some yardage props you like here for week seven. JJ, where are you seeing value right now uh, in the yardage department? So if you look at Robert Tunyon's number uh, across books, it's around that 32 and a half uh, yardage number. Uh, I, I think that you should hit the under there. Um, you know, he had his best route participation of the season last week. That's great. That translated to a 27% target share. You know, he entered the season with that ACL uh, and he's just been slowly working back up to being that full-time tight end. And we saw that last week. He had a great route participation, 27% target share. That's great. The problem is this matchup against Washington is not that great. Washington has ha- has seen a lot more of their targets against go to the tight or go to the wide receiver position than the tight end position. On the year, they're second in adjusted target or an ad- adjusted target share allowed to wide receivers. They're 27th in adjusted uh, target share allowed to tight ends. They're 29th in success rate allowed to wide receivers. They're fifth to tight ends. So they've been way, way worse against wide receivers this year than tight ends. And then the other point to make here about Tunyon and hitting the under, the Packers could lead in this game. The Packers might not uh, even throw the ball that much and have like insane volume through the air, whereas they haven't necessarily seen that kind of script, you know, over the last few weeks where they've been struggling a little bit more. Um, You know, FanDuel right now, FanDuel Sportsbook has them at a four and a half point favorite. Um, You know, this game could get out of hand. That's always a possibility. So that's another out for Robert Tunyon to hit the under here. So 32 and a half receiving yards is generally where he's been at. And I think hitting the under makes a lot of sense. I think that this this number seems like it's kind of an overestimation of the impact of no Randall Cobb, where it's like, okay, there's no Cobb. Tunyon's role expanded last week. We expect this progression for him to be linear when in actuality he might have already been expanded last week. And so you might not want to continue projecting more expansion if he's already there. Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly how I would look at it. Um, and then a, another uh, number that you could look at is PJ Walker. Uh, right now, he is projected at 151 and a half passing yards. It's across a lot of books. I think DK had it there. Um, I'm going to go over, actually. Uh, you know, I know that you hear PJ Walker and that scares you to, to go with o- an, an over for anything with PJ Walker. Um, I know this team is in complete disarray. Walker's coming off that horrific performance last week, but Carolina ran 44 plays in that game. I mean, that, that's that's a number that we should not expect from a projection standpoint week in and week out from any team. That's just an absurdly low number. Um, they're back at home now. Uh, they should see a negative game script against Tampa Bay, which should lead to more passing, even though they don't have any weapons to throw to outside of DJ Moore. But, but get this, Jim. If you look at the 175 quarterbacks this year, this excludes last night. I didn't throw that in the sample. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you look at the 175 quarterbacks, with 20 or more pass attempts in a game this year, okay? Which I think we can probably project that safely for P.J. Walker, even though it didn't necessarily go that way last week. But again, we should project a little bit regression from the play's run standpoint. Of the 175 quarterbacks with 20 or more pass attempts, 166 of them hit the over. So again, it's a bad situation. It's essentially a third-string quarterback. I understand all of that, but we're playing the odds here, right? I mean, that's, that's what this comes down to. And if this was more a neutral game script or, um, you know, if, if they were able to run the football really, really well, or I, I had confidence in that, then maybe I wouldn't feel as good about this bet. But I do think that going over that 151 and a half mark makes a lot of sense. Well, part of the reason why he wasn't getting a lot of yards last week is that they were like dinking and dunking because they had Christian McCaffrey and they don't have him anymore. So yeah. I think the the average depth of throw will have to naturally increase for Walker, which could give him more outs to getting over 151 and a half. Uh, at right now okay let's open up for touchdown props what are you seeing there for week seven we're gonna get crazy this week man let's do this it is, this is Party. we're just gonna have some fun here all right i got nico collins anytime touchdown plus 310 you can get that at a lot of books i think this was pulled from dk uh but you know obviously this is a long shot i have two long shots for you just mm-hmm. just spoiler alert um 
But but Nico Collins is averaging a 19% target share per game over his last four. He's seeing a ton of deep ball looks. Um, in this offense over these four games, he's had 62 receiving yards per game, and he has 246 receiving yards over this la- over the, these last four games without a touchdown. The only players in the NFL with more receiving yards than Nico Collins this year without a touchdown are both Pittsburgh Steelers. It's George Pickens <laughs> and Deontay Johnson, and the Steelers only have four passing touchdowns in their six games played, whereas the uh, Texans are averaging one passing touchdown per game. They have more passing touchdowns on fewer games played. Nico Collins, I think this could shock people. Nico Collins right now has more receiving yards than Brandon Cooks. But the the lines for these guys are, are you know, obviously there's a talent discrepancy, but the lines in these guys are, are drastically different. The Raiders have been terrible against the pass this year. They're sixth worst uh, in, in a uh, in a adjusted uh, success rate allowed to the wide receiver position. Uh, so I, I think Nico Collins makes a lot of sense as a, as a long shot uh, to score a touchdown in this game. And then I have an even bigger long shot uh, to, to score a touchdown this week. Sony Michelle plus 450 anytime touchdown. Joshua Kelly is banged up. He's been their backup running back, at least over the last couple of weeks. They sort of solidified that role for him. He's expected to miss a couple of weeks. Sony Michelle is the next man up behind Austin Eckler. Austin Eckler still doesn't have a single goal line rush this year. Actually, Sony Michelle leads the Chargers in goal line rushes. He has two. Josh Kelly has one. Austin Eckler has zero. And even when you look within the 10 yard line, Kelly has four rushes. Uh, Eckler has five. Um, and so if you look at this, the combination of what Joshua Kelly and Sony Michelle have done together this year, it's basically better than Austin Eckler from a usage standpoint close to the end zone. And then on top of that, you know, Eckler's not been a player uh, this year and in past years even too, where he sees like amazing snap shares. He's not like a 90% snap share kind of running back. He's in that 60 to 70% range, which leaves a lot of room for a backup running back like Sony Michelle to step in and get some work. I'm not expecting double digit touches or anything like that, but he could see uh, this goal line work. He could see short yardage stuff. Um, And then also they're playing Seattle. Seattle has been horrible against the run uh, and running backs this season. So I think all of that combined in a game that could see a decent amount of scoring, uh, all of that combined, I think makes sense for Sony Michelle at plus 450. Well, I think this is one of those situations where removing one piece matters a lot because if you have Joshua Kelly and Sonny Michelle both there, they're kind of splitting a weird role. But if it's a 40% snap share going to one guy and yeah. the goal line work, that's a significant role. And taking Kelly out of the equation, he hasn't practiced yet this week. Like that is an actual like difference maker for Michelle and especially a plus 450. I think that makes a ton of sense given his role. Yeah, look, it's it's long odds. I mean, they're 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 both obviously sort of sort of deeper plays, uh, but I, I think that they both at least both Nico Collins and Sony Michelle make a ton of sense. Yeah, Nico Collins plus three ten, as JJ mentioned, and Sony Michelle is plus four fifty. That is all that we have here for today and this week on covering the spread again. Our week seven at betting preview is up, and our week college football week eight preview is up as well. But JJ, want to give a big thank you to you once again. Good luck to you with the Tunyon bets, uh, the PJ Walker bet. You have to. I guess you could uh, go out to the stadium and root on PJ Walker yourself if you were so inclined. But uh, good luck this week, and we'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, Jim. All righty. Check out JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB. Find the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast wherever you get your podcasts and go to LateRound.com for all of JJ's content. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Good luck to all of you with your Week 7 and Week 8 college football bets. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 